Okay, page 640 in the Koran Sudur. I believe it's 640. Let's just double check. There we go. Perke Avos. Right, has it got nothing to do with avocados? The Perke Avos. Please don't confuse it. Um, welcome. Yeah, so we're going to spend another six weeks studying the Perke Avot. Every year, traditionally, we study the Perke Avot from the Shabbat after Pesach up until Shavuot. Some communities go ahead and study it all the way up until Rosh Hashanah. So what we're going to do is we're going to do the six-week one this year. And um, after Shavuot, we're going to start studying the um, Didache. Because Didache is also like a 13-week, 13 13-chapter 13 long book. So we're going to study that for 13 weeks, building up to Rosh Hashanah then. So we're going to do our Perkei Avot in six weeks from here on out. Right, so every year we usually do a different book uh, to see different rabbis' commentaries on the Perkei Avot because there's so many different opinions and the stuff, so it's really interesting to learn everyone's different viewpoints. So this year we're going to use the... The Koran's got the small little one. It hasn't got much commentary, so I'm going to have to fill in a lot of stuff as we go, but uh, maybe we'll pick up some nice stuff this year. We'll see how it goes. So Perkei Avot is usually translated as the ethics of our fathers. Uh, literally translating... Perke is a peric is like a verse. So it's the verses of our fathers. But we call it the ethics of our fathers because these are like a collection. It's almost like the greatest hits album of our rabbis. You know, you don't have to buy the CD with all the other 11 horrible songs if you just want a single. This is the greatest hits. This is now BC. <laughs> okay. <laughs> anyway, nowadays we had the what? Now 2000 and that stuff. This is now BC. So um, the Perke vote originally was only five chapters long. Um, when we started this uh, custom of studying it after Pesach, we decided to add another chapter from another part of the Talmud. So that's chapter 6. So we'll get to that later when we get to chapter 6. And uh, the reason why we study this uh, between Pesach and Shavuot is because of the whole idea that they're connected. Pesach and Shavuot are connected. We had to get out all the old chametz and start a new batch of dough after Pesach. That was the Omer. That's why we're counting the Omer. And the Omer is not just about counting the actual grains. It's about counting how we are changing ourselves. We also have to be influenced through these six weeks. We have to change, go from a certain level to a higher level. That's why it's 49 days. We talk about in Judaism that there are 49 levels of impurity. So we're trying to get ourselves purified all the way up to level 50, or level 1 actually, so that we can be clean when Shavuot comes around. Because what do we celebrate in Shavuot? The giving of the Torah. And the Torah was given to which kind of species on this earth? Homo sapiens. The Torah was given to humans. So don't be an animal when we get to Shavuot. You won't understand the Torah. It won't make sense to you. It won't apply to you. So during these six weeks, we're trying to work on ourselves to make sure that we become proper, refined people so that we can receive the Torah and move forward from there. Right, so uh, yeah, five weeks. We're going to study a chapter each week. Today we're studying chapter number one. And uh, I want to start off with a little story that they remind us of over here in the intro of this book. There's a famous story in the Talmud about a rabbi who uh, kind of like dies and goes to heaven um, and then gets revived. And then they ask him, what did you see when you were up there? And this is the funnest thing I used to always see in the churches as well. Every five months, some pastor claims to have died and went to heaven. And to hear what they saw when they were up there. One says, I saw my congregation bought me a Boeing Right, another one talks about streets of candy floss and stuff like this, crazy stuff. Anyway, so they asked this guy, what did you see when you were up there? And he says, I saw an upside down world. All the ethics up there were opposite to the ethics of this earth. We've got things wrong down here. The rich are not the ones who are prominent, it's the poor. And this is the thing that Yeshua talks about. We call this divine reversal. That the ethics, the true ethics that we're supposed to be looking for is not defined on this earth. It's defined in the heavens. It's the same as what we spoke about this morning, right? Where should we find our ethics? What's the source? Hashem. Don't bring our own preconceived ideas into the Holy of Holies. The Holy of Holies is where Hashem communicates to us and tells us what is required. So the Perkei vote, the ethics of our fathers, we're trying to learn those ethics. So one of the things we're going to learn maybe next week is something like, who is wise? You would think someone who's got a degree from university. Look at what universities are doing now. They've got a bunch of homeless people camping there supporting Palestine. <laughs> They're not the wise people in this world. So clearly there's something wrong with the world's understanding of wisdom and ethics. So that's what Perkei Avot is going to do for us. It's going to help us see the deeper meaning behind um, everything in this life. It's going to be really, really good. All right, now one thing you'll notice as we study the Perkei Avot. Have any of you guys never studied the Perkei Avot before? Okay. You guys haven't done it with us before. Have you ever done it yet? I can't remember. We used to do it every year, many years ago, and then COVID struck and I got lazy. Uh, oh, yeah, we weren't allowed to get together. Um, so that was a problem. Uh, Stephanie, your hand is up as well. You've also never done it before. Okay, welcome to the party. Don't worry. Half of the people have never done it before. So that's fantastic. One thing you're going to realize is we're studying here from rabbis that lived around about the time of Yeshua. Many of them before the time of Yeshua and many of them at the time of Yeshua. And because of that, you're going to notice that a lot of these Mishnahs, not verses, we call them Mishnahs, that we're going to study, 
sound almost as if they're quoted directly from the Gospels. And that's amazing because it helps us fill in some of the um, understanding of what the, uh, what's the, the context behind the sayings of the Gospels and what was the rabbinic setup in that time will help us understand the meaning and the words of Yeshua and the Apostles in the New Testament. So that's fantastic. There's one guy, a scholar, who's actually found more than 400 parallels between the Perkei Avot and the Gospels. 400. So this is the type of text we're going to be studying. It's really awesome. It's really fantastic. Um, so we always refer to guys called sages. Now sages, many religions have sages. Our sages, in Hebrew, we call them the Chazal. And these sages um, come in different groups. So the earliest group that we're going to talk about is called the Zoo Goat. Nothing to do with the goat at the zoo. Zoo Goat. <laughs> zoo Goat means pears. We were studying um, Yom Kippur service this morning, so goat is on my mind. Um, <laughs> Zugot means the pairs. So there would usually be two rabbis in charge, the Zugot. We're going to learn about them. I'll get to them when we get to their names as well and point them out to them. After them, we got guys called the Tanaim. Tanaim are the ones we're going to be quoting the most. These are the ones who's uh, pretty much the time of Yeshua and Paul, those guys. Were the Zugot uh, um, adversaries? Not always, but they did like to argue with each other. For example, the the most famous Zugot that everyone knows is Hillel and Shemai. So Hillel and Shemai, they were always arguing halakha with each other, but always in a nice way. Uh, and they both held a position of power over the community. Um, so they were representatives of the community. So it was alright for them to argue with each other and then still accept the ruling. That's what Judaism is, right? Judaism encourages arguing and asking questions and debate. Not for the sake of, I know better than you, for the sake of getting to the truth and the right answer. And that's very often a thing that we overlook. Hey? When people start arguing stuff and asking questions and saying, my point of view is this, we, I'll agree to disagree. No, that's not how it works. We disagree, but we agree on the ruling that's at the end of the day. And that's what the Zugot were like. So not all of them had issues with the other. But as we study them today, we're going to see some of them actually keep reproving each other for certain things as well. So yeah, so we'll see that. So we have these two guys in charge. Then we had the Tanaim, and after the Tanaim came a group of guys called the Amarayim, and after the Amarayim came the Savarayim, then came the Geonim, then came the Rishonim, and then came the Acharonim. Don't stress. Don't worry about it. Just, uh, you can go watch this. I'm trying to record this this year, so you can go back and look at that sometime as well. So those are different um, stages of the sages, if I can call it that. There we go. We've trademarked a, uh, a phrase, the stages of the sages, um, and how they came about. But before the Zugot came, we have to learn a little bit about where we got all of these traditions in the first place. So open with me, page 640, Ethics of the Fathers. Every chapter starts with this beautiful little introduction. It says, all of Israel have a share in the world to come. What do you guys think about that? By the way, you're welcome to ask questions in chat. All of Israel have a share in the world to come. What do you guys think about that? Does it bother anyone? No. Yeah? Romans 11 26. What's the connection between that? It's the exact same saying. So if it bothers you to read this and say, how can you say all Israel will be saved? You must ask Paul the same thing, because Paul says the same thing. Paul says all of Israel will be saved. Now, how do we understand that? There are some different um, opinions. The, the main one I want to share with you is the idea that, yes, there are individuals that are wicked that are going to be cut off from Israel. There's many commandments in the Torah that tells us, if you disobey this commandment, you will be cut off from Israel. So yes, there are people that won't make it, even though they belong to Israel. So when we're talking about this, we're talking about it in a general sense. All of Israel, as a collective, Israel will be saved. The Talmud also comes and tells us there are many certain things that you do. If you do that, you jeopardize your share in the world to come. If you do X, Y, Z, you will jeopardize your share in the world to come. But still, all of Israel will be saved. There's a few guys here and there that decided they're going to follow another path. Too bad for them. Okay? So it's collectively. Um, and from this we learn that um, all of Israel needs to be considered righteous. So there's a very important connection to the collective of what we call Israel. And we all have to be looking out for each other's back. We're meant to be a unity, a unified people. We're not supposed to have splits and divisions. That's why the, uh, the high priest would cry when they ask him, when they make the oath before Yom Kippur to say, promise us you will not do it according to the way of the Sadducees. And he'd cry. He'd cry for the fact that he has to be asked if he is a Sadducee or not. There's not supposed to be any splits within a unified people of God. When the Mashiach comes... We won't have any splits whatsoever. It'll be Mashiach says so. Remember the game Simon says? Mashiach says. It's going to be the game we play when Mashiach comes. And we're going to know what the ruling is. End of story. So all Israel has a share in the world to come. So mm. it's possible some people can lose their share in the world to come. 
definitely. Especially if they're um, corrupt, if they're all of these guys that were just caught for embezzling the shares. <laughs> Stein, what's that guy in South Africa? <laughs> Stein, off, there we go. Any idea what the word for share is in Hebrew? Have a look there in the Hebrew, those of you that can read Hebrew. So it starts off, you see there on top, Pedek Rishon, uh, and then it says, Kol Yisrael Yeshlahem Chelek Leolam. A Chelek. Chelek is the word for like a plot, your little plot of land. All of Israel have a plot or a share of land in the world to come, meaning that you actually have citizenship in the world to come already. You've got your visa, you've got your stamp, you're ready to go. When the Messianic era arrives, or the world to come, which by the way, please forgive us now in advance, as we study this for the next six weeks, we're going to confuse the two terms, Messianic era and world to come. We're going to confuse it because the rabbis do that. Um, in the world to come, you have citizenship already. And that is a concept we find communicated to us in the New Testament about Yeshua. As disciples of Yeshua, you are all citizens already of the Messianic era. Yeshua has given you that passport, that stamp, that visa. You didn't even have to ask Godfrey to go and stand in line for you for hours to get it at home affairs. Okay, and uh, of course, uh, through Yeshua, you are grafted in to Israel. So you're part of all of Israel, called Israel, you are grafted in. So all of you sitting here, you have your little plot waiting for you when you get... Not a room No, a plot. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) No, in the Messianic era, everyone's going to sit under their own vine fig tree, right? Mm -hmm. So you've got a vine and fig tree planted there for you. You have to get there and then you can partake of its fruits. Okay, so that's the first thing. Then, and, uh, we're gonna, I was thinking about if I have enough space on my phone to record this entire thing. It depends on how long it is. Now that John's here, I know it's going to make take twice as long. <laughs> but we encourage questions, remember? So yeah, let's chat about it. Yeah. <laughs> my plot worked. <laughs> we have a share with Wherever it is. You said the world to come and then you changed it. To the Messianic era. era. Yeah. Not the same. So if you want to place it, remember we're talking here in uh, esoteric terms about a plot. If you want a literal plot, we'd probably say in the land of Israel. In, no. It's full. No. Um, that's a very confusing one. In the Messianic era, not necessarily. In the world to come after the Messianic era, there we can say yes, because we're all going to go to Mars apparently. Elon Musk has broken that down for us, Rabbi Elon. Somewhere it said that uh, yeah. your citizenship is in heaven. Mm. Mm. Right? So uh, that was before the Messianic era. Mm. Okay. Um, our, our, our citizenship is contained in Yeshua in heaven. Yeah, the citizenship, yeah. Citizenship is already in practice, even though the land has not yet been, mm. what's the word? Mm-hmm. Dispersed, revealed. We haven't had Independence Day yet for the Messianic era, yeah. It's a good thing you've got to be thinking about that now. All right, so then we have a quote from Isaiah 16. It says, your people are all righteous. How's that? Eh? Your people are all righteous. They shall inherit the land forever. This is speaking about the literal land of Israel. Eretz Israel. Um, they shall inherit the land forever. They are a shoot of my own planting. Has anyone ever called you a shoot before? A straight shot, maybe. So the word shoot there is Netzer. That sounds familiar, right? Nazareth is named after Netzer. Right, so it's a little netzer that uh, we're a shoot of God's own planting. You know, there's a famous saying, uh, a famous verse from Isaiah where it talks about uh, Mashiach, and it calls him a the netzer David, the shoot of David. And uh, we actually have one of our prayers in the Amidah. We can maybe let's go look at it. I didn't plan to look at it, but we can check it out. Uh, since we're here studying stuff, go to page one o. Sorry, one one. Uh, Here we go, 124, page 124. So in Amidah, of course, we've got 19 different blessings that we recite. On a weekday, at least, and Shabbat is only seven, because you can't ask for too many things on a Shabbat. You've already got everything you need. So page 124, you'll see the the, the blessing there is entitled The Kingdom of David. Those of you that can read Hebrew. Es Tzemach David. May the offshoot of your servant David soon flower. Es Tzemach David Avdecha Mehera Satzmiach. We've got the word Tzemach in that last word as well. It's the root word of the last one as well. Uh, may the offshoot of your servant David soon flower. It's talking about the Mashiach. 
Mashiach is the root of David. And may his pride be raised high by your salvation. Vakarnoi torum be Yeshua secho. Yeshua's name is, of course, to mean salvation. For we wait for your salvation all day. Ki lishua secho kivinu kol hayom. All day. Blessed are you, Lord, who makes the glory of salvation flourish. Baruch atah ad Hashem. Matzmiach. Tzemach is there again. Matzmiach. Keren Yeshua. So this prayer is loaded with reference to Messiah and specifically to Yeshua. So keep that in mind in weekdays when you guys do do your Amidah, that we're talking about Mashiach being the Tzemach, that root that um, springs forth from the root of, uh, from the branch of Jesse. As Isaiah talks about him being um, a Tzemach that shoots forth from the branch of Jesse. It's the line, the Davidic line that refers to the Mashiach. All right, so it says, They are a shoot of my own planting, a work of my own hands, that I may be glorified. That's the purpose of your creation, to glorify God. That's how we end up finding ourselves saying that the people are all righteous when we glorify God. So this is the introduction that we do before every chapter of the Prokevot. Now we can go into Mishnah number one. All right, so Moshe received the Torah at Sinai. What does that mean? On Shabbat, he received the Torah. Okay, what else do you guys get from that little sentence? Moshe received the Torah at Sinai. He received more than just the written Torah. So he received what we call the written Torah and the oral Torah. The oral Torah, Torah, um, well, pay from the mouth, the oral Torah, uh, and then the written Torah as well. Now, in saying that, though, people might be wondering, what's going on here? How is it that we say there's an oral Torah and a written Torah? Have a look at this. One of the things we do every morning when we start off our prayers, go to page 10 in your Siddur. I want to show you something. And of course, we've been talking a lot about the Sadducees and the Pharisees lately, and we spoke about the fact that the Pharisees believe in the oral Torah. Uh, then we need more than just the written Torah to understand stuff, because there's problems, right? If the Torah says, you shall slaughter meat the way I showed you, mm. the Torah doesn't tell us anything about the way he showed Moses. So we need the oral Torah to be able to interpret that, and there's many other places we need the oral Torah. So what we do then is on page 10, um, on page 8 already, we start off our prayers with a blessing over the Torah, right? So if you've done a blessing over the Torah, immediately after you do a blessing, you have to actually fulfill that blessing. Right? You, you want to make sure that you get to the, the action of the blessing as soon as possible. Otherwise, it's a blessing in vain, which means you've used the Lord's name in vain. So as soon as we do recite the blessing over the Torah on page 8, we need to study some Torah. So what do we do on page 10? We recite Yevarechacha, Numbers chapter 6. We, so we recite some Torah, Numbers chapter 6. And then what do we recite after Numbers chapter 6? Something from the Mishnah. And then after the Mishnah, we recite Shabbat 127a, something from the Talmud, from the Gemara. So every morning when we do the blessing over the Torah before our prayers start, we're saying the Torah consists of the written and the oral law. Both of them are contained in what we call the Torah. Okay, so we do that on a daily basis to remind ourselves of that. And you know what? It's not just... Um, uh, let me get myself a New Testament so I can show you guys something. Because it's not just there. Our apostles taught the same thing. Let me read to you guys something from, I think it's 1 Corinthians. Let's check it out. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 3. It's the first time I'm using this Bible for it. That'll be cool. Uh -huh. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 3. Listen to this. Paul says, For among the first things I passed on to you... Oh, by the way, before we get to that, let's just read this again. Moses received the Torah at Mount Sinai. The word received in Hebrew, have a look there. Moshe Kibel. What is Kibel? Do you guys recognize that word? Yeah. Kabbalah. That's the root word for Kabbalah. Kabbalah means to receive. So the whole idea of realizing you created nothing in this world, you receive everything from Hashem. So this is where the root is for Kabbalah. Received. It means we received the Torah from Mount Sinai. We didn't think it up ourselves. It's not someone's invention. Moshe received the Torah as a gift. Kabel from Hashem on Mount Sinai. So now this is what Paul says here in 1 Corinthians 15 verse 3. He says, For among the first things I passed on to you was what I also received. Have a quick scan for the rest of this um, Mishnah. Moses received the Torah at Mount Sinai and handed it on to Joshua. Joshua handed it on to the elders. The elders to the prophets and the prophets handed it on to the men of the great assembly. You see, originally it was received at Sinai, but after that we had a job to pass it on. Paul is talking in the same language here. The exact same language as this Mishnah, telling us that the teachings of Yeshua were also received from him directly, because remember what did Yeshua say? I hear directly from Hashem, 
And as disciples and apostles, they had to pass it on. So I also received, namely this, that the Messiah died for our sins in accordance with what the Tanakh says. And he was buried and he was raised on the third day in accordance with what the Tanakh says. And he was seen by Peter and then by the twelve, etc., etc. It passed on and passed on and passed on. It's the exact same story as Mishnah of chapter 1, uh, Prakeva chapter 1, verse 1. The same thing. The story of Messiah and the testimony of Messiah is just like the Torah that was received and now we need to pass it on till it goes to the ends of the world. Uh, another place where we see this idea that our apostles had to pass on their traditions is in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 15. Listen to this. He says, Therefore, brothers, stand firm and hold the traditions that you were taught by us, whether we spoke them or wrote them in a letter. So even the New Testament, what we've got as the New Testament is the written New Testament. Paul's telling us there's also an oral tradition for the apostles in addition to the Bible that we have as well. Second Thessalonians 2, uh, 2 verse 15. Yeah, we're going to look again at 3 verse 6. 3 verse 6, he says a similar thing. Check it out, 3 verse 6. Now, in the name of the Lord Yeshua, the Messiah, we command you, brothers, to stay away from any brother who is leading a life of idleness, a life of not keeping, with the tradition that you received from us. So the tradition, these ethics of our fathers, is not just a thing that was only for Old Testament rabbinic Judaism. It's even for us as disciples of Yeshua. There are so many sayings of Yeshua that we don't have recorded in the Gospels as well, right? The Gospel of John tells us there wasn't enough paper or ink in this world to write down all the things. And that's why when we do study like New Testament and when we're going to study Chronicles of the Apostles at the end of this year, we're going to start quoting extra non-biblical texts as well. And scholars have found certain sayings that are appearing all over in non-canonical texts. It, which, te- which leads us to believe that maybe this was one of the oral teachings that they passed down about what Yeshua said and taught to his disciples that was never written in the, one of the four actual Gospels. So there's many extra sayings uh, that we have. For example, Paul. We find Paul quoting Yeshua somewhere in, the, in one of his letters. We don't have that quote anywhere in the Gospels. Paul says Yeshua said this. Once again, it's his oral teaching that was passed out and Paul happened to put it into a letter. All right, so Moses received the Torah at Sinai. That's how far we've got in one line so far. We're going to be here all afternoon. And he handed it to Joshua. Uh, the word handed it there, if you look in the Hebrew in the second line, is U Mesora. Ever heard of the Mesora? Mesora is basically our traditions. So he handed the tradition down to him, which is a lesson for us. We have to pass it on. Uh, the good news in Hebrew, we call it the Bezora, or the B. Bezora is the good news. When someone brings good tidings. And so it brings good tidings. It's the same here with Umasora. It's the tidings that you bring on to someone. So, Moshe received the Torah, handed it to Joshua. Joshua to the elders. Anyone know who the elders are? Anyone with gray hair? <laughs> so the elders were, who came after Joshua? Caleb. Joshua passed it on to Caleb. All the way up until the days of Eli. Remember Eli, who sat there in the tent of, uh, in the door of the tent of the tabernacle, who fell over backwards and broke his neck? Yeah. So those are the elders, from Caleb to Eli. So all of the tradition, the written Torah and the oral Torah, was passed on to Joshua, then Joshua to those elders, up to Eli, and from the elders to the prophets. The prophets, Samuel, from Samuel onwards all the way up until Malachi, who traditionally, they say, is the last prophet we had. All of those prophets, they held the Torah and the oral Torah, and they passed it on. The prophets handed it down to the men of the great assembly. They are called the Anshay Knesset Gedola. You can see here on the left, Le'anshei Knesset Hagdola, the men of the great assembly. Who are the men of the great assembly? Tradition tells us this was Ezra and Nehemiah and all the people of his generation, all the way up until a famous rabbi we're going to learn about shortly called Shimon Hatzadik. He was also a Kohen, Shimon Hatzadik. So those are the men of the great assembly. And I don't think we realize just how important Ezra is actually for modern day religion. Ezra is the source of all customs that we find in monotheistic religion today. The Muslims, us, the Christians, Orthodox Jews. Ezra is the one who set out everything. The order of the Bible, which text we use for the Bible, how we're going to understand certain words. The prayers that we have today, that we have in the Siddur, they say were arranged by the men of the Great Assembly, starting with Ezra. Ezra is the one who decided we're going to pray three times a day, and we're going to have an Amidah that has to have a certain amount of blessings. And they worked on it with the men of the Great Assembly. He is such an amazing influence in religion today that many sages say many rabbis say he had the potential to be the mashiach himself that's how important ezra is for judaism 
yeah, he's a massive, massive influence of it. All right, so that's the men of the Great Assembly from him all the way up until Shimon HaTzadik. The men of the Great Assembly, they said three things. Let's learn what they said. Number one, be careful in judgment. Why would he tell us to be careful in judgment? Well, first of all, majority of these sayings we're studying in the Perkei Avot um, were meant for these rabbis' disciples. Okay, and their disciples would eventually become judges on the Sanhedrin. So many, very often what we're going to do is, is when we're studying these chapters, we're going to find um, advice about how to be a judge and how to judge others. Um, it's not necessarily speaking directly to every one of us sitting here, although, you know, we have to judge favorably as well. But it's specifically speaking about people that are going to be judges. I see uh, Jan is on here online, so Jan, you must listen very carefully. You are one of our high court judges. So um, this is a lesson for you. Uh, so number one, they say, be careful in judgment. Now remember in the temple, the Sanhedrin used to sit in the temple itself. And do you want to know where? I don't know exactly where. In the walls of the temple. So uh, I'm not going to fetch it now. But they sat in the walls of the temple. That's where our courts were. And we had 71 judges sitting there. Why do we have 71? Because it must be an uneven number. So that if there is a split decision, so that you don't get a split decision. Right? So there's always going to be a difference of at least one. So we had 71 judges sitting in the Sanhedrin uh, in the temple. Uh, in the smaller courts, like your provincial court, we had... Uh, 23 judges sitting in that, over that court. And then in your local community, like even your own synagogue, you would have what's called a Beit Din, which is three judges that sit uh, and make rulings. So we do that to every year when it comes to Rosh Hashanah. When we have to annul our vows, we have three judges sitting here in front, and they can annul the vows. But eventually, if it has to go to the, the highest court of all, that is the 71 judges. That's where these sages usually sit. Okay. So he says to them, you must be careful in your judgment. A judge, like Gan Yan was here with us, you have to be extremely careful when you're making a judgment because you've got two very well-trained lawyers whose job it is is to try and lie to you to make their client or the, you know, the, the defendant or the accuser to make them look like an angel with wings when you should very well know their job is trying to trick you. So don't be tricked. You have to be very careful in your judgments. Yeshua warns us as well. When you judge, you should judge as you would like to be judged. Uh, I'm going to read to you a little commentary at the bottom of this uh, commentary of Perkei Avot. It says here, Dr. Te uh, Dr. Dr. Daniel Kahneman, the Israeli Nobel Prize winner in economics in 2002, coined the phrase, illusion of validity. In his landmark research, he found that people tend to think that their judgments are valid even when based simply on first impressions or relatively short observations. Dr. Kahneman demonstrated that people are often badly mistaken. Not only are their er initial reactions misleading, but judgments are highly influenced by personal inclinations and by language or circumstances in which problems are posed. The best hope for arriving at truth is to overcome your illusion of validity and carefully study as much objective data as is available to you. So these judges need to be seriously, seriously careful. That's the first thing the men of the Great Assembly thought about saying to us. Secondly, they said, you shall raise up many disciples. We just read earlier there that we have to uh, do Masora. We have to transmit the Torah, the oral Torah and the written Torah. So they tell us, make sure you raise up many disciples and make a fence for the Torah. Okay, what does it mean to make a fence for the Torah? We live in South Africa, we know very well about fences, electric fences, <laughs> and how important they are for our survival. What does it mean that you should make a fence for the Torah? Judaism gets a lot of flack for this idea, right? We protect the Torah and we protect the commandments. So what do we do? Is we set a border around the commandments and we never end up reaching the point where we actually break the commandment on the inside. Those are what we call fences for the Torah. Many people say these are rabbinic laws, man-made laws, but it's in order to protect the Torah. Yeah, it's a man-made law. There's nothing wrong with it. We're supposed to protect the Torah. We're supposed to guard the Torah. It's a commandment to actually guard the Torah. So setting up fences is something we have to do to protect it. And in fact, Yeshua did the exact same thing. Yeshua, for example, a very famous teaching we all know about, where he's speaking about tithing. He was saying to some of the Pharisees that they're hypocrites because they tithe mint, dill, and cumin. Where in the Torah does it say you have to tithe those? Nowhere. You don't have to tithe mint, dill, and cumin. You only have the seven species, right? They do it as an extra fence around the, tithe, uh, the mitzvah of tithing. They, mint e they, they tithe even their mental and cumin. Yeshua doesn't say, you fools, you shouldn't do that. He says, yes, you should be doing that, but you should focus on the weightier matters of the Torah, justice, faith, and mercy. 
So he doesn't throw away the fence and break down the fence and say you don't do the fence. He says, yes, you must do the fence, but don't do that and then neglect the point of what's inside the fence in the first place, the Torah itself. That was the issue. The issue wasn't the fences. The issue was that they were too busy checking the fence to actually look after the sheep inside the fence. And uh, Matthew 23, Yeshua has got a lot to say about this. You have heard it said, do not murder. What does Yeshua do? He puts a fence around it. And he says, if you even hate your brother in your heart, you've already committed murder. Matthew 23 is Yeshua putting up fences for us. He was a carpenter. He's a good guy. He knows how to put up fences. So don't go and you know, hit that. This is exactly what Yeshua was doing. So this means something for us as well. So those are the three things that the men of the Great Assembly said. Be careful in judgment. Raise up many disciples and make a fence for the Torah. All right, let's move on to mission number two. Oh, yeah, Khat. Just quickly, um, we read in Matthew 15 this morning that the washing was unwashed hands, or eating was unwashed hands, because you make the unclean. Mm. Uh, was that just a tradition, or was that sort of a fence? That was an extra tradition. Um, so we have a few washings of the hands. Um, we have the washing of the hands that we did, for example, on Pesach, um, twice. And the kids are supposed to ask, why do we wash hands twice? So usually we only wash hands before eating bread. So like we did with the kids in the brocha in front here. So that is the one that's based upon the mitzvah of um, what happened in the temple. But in the times of the temple, in Yeshua's times, there was an extra washing. Because people were so concerned about ritual purity in those days. Because the temple was still standing, and they were scared that you shake a guy's hand, and he just went and shook hands with his mother's urn or something that was on the TV. And now he's contracted ritual impurity to you, so you can't go to the temple. So people were extra, extra cautious. So they had an extra washing of the hands, above, above and beyond the Natiliat Yadim that we do. And that is the one that they were talking about. So um, it wasn't even... Uh, it wasn't even what to do with food, right? That Mark chapter 17 had nothing to do with food. It was the idea about, about kosher or unkosher or anything. But it was just simply about the extra tradition of Levitical purity that the people were keeping. Yeshua was saying, hey, some of your disciples didn't keep this extra level of Levitical purity. And Yeshua said to them, hey, you guys are getting lost on the fence and you're missing what the Torah is about. Now, in saying that, it says some of your disciples didn't do it, which means Yeshua did do it. Otherwise, they would have taken up issue with him. So Yeshua did do that washing, but some of his disciples didn't. Customers vary. So yeah, sometimes people get caught up on the fence, which in South Africa is a good thing. Uh, that's why you put up the fence. <laughs> but um, that's unfortunately what he was saying there. So they neglecting the weightier matters. You're calling out someone because they're not following your tradition that you made up five minutes ago. What kind of a person are you? Yeah. 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 Well spotted there. All right, number two, Shimon HaTzadik. So we mentioned him, the men of the Great Assembly. Started with Ezra and ended with this guy, Shimon HaTzadik. So who is Shimon HaTzadik? Let me read to you guys a little bit that they say here at the bottom of this book. Uh, Shimon HaTzadik. Shimon served as the high priest in the second temple in Jerusalem. He was popularly known as HaTzadik, the just, Simon the just, because his righteousness was so profound. The Talmud reports that Shimon met Alexander the Great. You guys know Alexander the Great? Right? Any of your Greek friends have bragged about him sometime? Uh, the Talmud reports that he met Alexander the Great when the conqueror passed through the land of Israel. So Alexander the Great once decided he's going to come and defeat Israel. and He's going to take over Jerusalem for himself. And as he approached Israel, um, Shimon HaTzadik heard about him coming. So Shimon HaTzadik woke up in the middle of the night, got dressed in his high priest clothing, and went out with some of his colleagues with little candles in the middle of the night to go meet Shimon HaTzadik. And they walked up to Shimon HaTzadik as he was approaching Jerusalem. And Shimon HaTzadik, ah, sorry, uh, um, what's his name? Alexander the Great. They walked up to Alexander the Great as he approached Jerusalem. And Alexander the Great, with his entire army, saw him coming. He climbed off his horse and bowed down in front of Shimon HaTzadik. And his officers were asking, um, yo, Alexander, what's happening? What's up? And he says, you guys don't understand. Before every military victory that I have won in my life, the night before, I have a dream. And in the dream, this man appears to me and says, you will win the battle tomorrow. I finally met the guy. <laughs> the Kohen Gadol. So apparently, Hashem sent a dream every single night before Alexander the Great went to war of a vision of the Kohen Gadol telling him whether he's allowed to win that fight or not. And he bowed down and he said to him, listen, I'm, I want to take Jerusalem, but now here you are. So what happens? Alexander the Great was deeply impressed by Simon's spiritual demeanor. So Alexander ordered that, a, that instead of destroying Jerusalem, a statue of himself be placed in the temple courtyard. Because yeah, he was Alexander the Great. Yeah. <laughs> Imagine making that your nickname. <laughs> but Shimon explained that Jewish law forbade placing statues in the temple. It's an idol, right? So as a sign of respect, though, Shimon said, 
All our male children born to the priests this year will be named Alexander after you. And thus the name Alexander became a Jewish name. Till today, Alexander is a Jewish name as well. And you wonder, how does that become a Jewish name? Does it sound Jewish to me? This is the story behind, behind why there are so many Jews with the name Alexander. Yeah, yes, um, your son is Alexander as well. Right, a very interesting story about Shimon Atzadik. Okay, so Shimon Atzadik, what did he say? Uh, Shimon Atzadik was one of the last survivors of the Great Assembly. He used to say, on three things the world stands. Okay, There's, it doesn't mean that they believe the earth, the earth was flat and stood on three pillars. Please don't confuse that. Uh, it means that for the, for the purpose of these three, these three things, the world continues to spin. Otherwise, the world would be meaningless. Number one, on the Torah. Number two, on divine worship. And number three, on acts of loving kindness. Torah, divine worship, and acts of loving kindness. So some of our commentators point out that these uh, reflect to three different um, interactions we have. On the Torah, that refers to yourself and how you study the Torah. Divine worship, that refers to God and how we interact with God. And acts of loving kindness is with your neighbor, how you treat your neighbor around you. So in all spheres of life, this is where you should be focusing. If you're doing it right, if you're living your life with purpose, then the world shall continue. And they also say that all three of these refer to one of the three patriarchs. Who were the three fathers? Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. What was Abraham's most famous trait? Loving kindness, the bottom one there. Uh, Isaac, what was Isaac known for? Divine worship, the middle one, remember? He was the one that actually got sacrificed on the altar in the Akedah. Divine worship literally means the service, the temple service. In the Hebrew there it says ha-avoda, avoda. Remember we spoke this morning about Avoda and Avoda Zara, which is a, you know evil worship. This is the temple service. So he was actually given, his life was given um, towards Hashem. And um, the, Jacob, what was Jacob known for? Dwelling in tents. Remember his brother Esau went out hunting. Jacob dwelled in tents. What did he do in the tent all day? They didn't have Netflix back then. <laughs> he was studying the word of Hashem. They say he was in the tents of Shem and Ever studying the Torah before it was even given. Or the traditional Torah, the oral Torah that was passed down from Adam already. That's what he was studying. So these are the three. Jacob, Isaac, and Abraham. For their sake as well, and their, uh, their midot, their characteristics, the world continues to spin. They talk about this as a table with three legs. The world is like a table with three legs. Not because we believe in flat earth, just to give us the analogy. The problem is, one of these legs is missing right now. We do not have divine worship today. The temple is destroyed. We can't do the offerings in front of Hashem. So the existence of this world is teetering and balancing at the moment like a two-legged, meant-to-be tripod chair. Which is why we have to pray that it be his beaver. We have to pray and worship like it matters, like it's up to us to keep this chair, this world, from falling in and on itself. That is how we're supposed to be praying every day. We do the acts of Gemilat Chasadim. We have to do acts of loving kindness as much as we can. We have to study as much Torah as we can. And we have to do as much divine worship as we can as well. Okay. Let's move on to Mishnah number three. I think there's 18 Mishnahs for this first chapter. So at this rate, we'll get there by next Shabbat. Number three. Antigonus of Soko received the tradition from Shimon Hatzadik. So we spoke about him last week. You guys were here last week, I think. Or you watched the... Hopefully you watched it on YouTube. Uh, Antigonus of Soko, by the way, not a, Jew, uh, not a very Jewish name, right? Antigonos, what does that sound like? <laughs> Greek, so we already know here, Greek culture started entering into Judaism at this stage already. Um, Hellenistic culture started coming into uh, Judaism at a rabid pace. And that's why you find from this point onwards, many rabbis have got Greek names as well. Paul, Greek name, right? So uh, don't be shocked at it. It's the same as today, where a Jew today has an English name. And then they have Hebrew names, which uh, we don't really use in public, so you don't get killed by terrorists. Um, but then you get people that go and name their child Judah or Mordechai, which you can't really hide. And they have to repent for the rest of their life. Okay, so Antigonus of Soko received the tradition from Shimon Atzadik. He used to say, don't be like servants who serve their master on condition of receiving a reward. But be like servants who serve their master, not on condition of receiving a reward. And let the fear of heaven be upon you. So the idea here, we spoke about it this morning, right? We should do the Torah not because we want the reward at the end of it. It's like, uh, the only people that do that are children, that you try and bribe to be nice so that they can give sweetie if they're not naughty. We have to mature. We need to get beyond that. We don't do the Torah just because we want the rewards at the end. We have to do the Torah because we realize it is the source of our life. It is the way that we show our love to Hashem and our closeness to Hashem. We have to do the Torah for its own sake. It has to be a selfless 
devotion in studying the Torah. Don't do it because of the condition of reward. Yes, there is reward and there is punishment. Don't get that wrong. And that's where a problem comes in. Of course, we told you guys last week that um, Antigonus of Soka had two disciples. One was called Sadok and one was called Beothus. And these are the founders of the Sadducees and the Bethusians. So Tzadok and Beothus, they misunderstood this Mishnah. They thought that what the rabbi was saying is that there is no such thing as a reward in the afterlife. So they don't believe in the afterlife. So that's where the Sadducees get their idea from, that they don't believe in the resurrection, they don't believe in the afterlife, they don't believe in reward. They say, this right here now is what you got and what you get. End of story. So those two disciples misunderstood this Mishnah and they started off that entire problem. And today, Baruch Hashem, we have Cholent because of them. Okay. Hope you guys enjoyed the Cholent today. All right, let's go to Mishnah number four. Here we begin uh, with the Zugot actually mentioned here. Although I guess um, Antigonus of Soko and Shimon Atzadik were actually the first Zugot. Uh, the two of them were the first two. And then we've got here, Yose ben Yozer of Tereda and Yose ben Yochanan of Jerusalem. Let me read to you guys about the Zugot here in the commentary. It says, With the rise of the Maccabean period, the mid-2nd century, uh, mid century BCE, religious leadership devolved upon the Zugot, the pairs of rabbis. These two men held the office of Nasi, the president, and Av Beit Din, the head of the court. Remember I told you there were 71 elders in the Sanhedrin? These guys were the head. There was the president and the head of the court. The first mentioned, Nasi, is generally, or the first one's name mentioned here in the Mishnah, is generally assumed to have been the Nasi, and the second one's name is mentioned would have been the Av Beit Din. The five generations of Zagot began in the year 142 BC and lasted until the deaths of Hilal and Shammai early in the first century common era. So, we always had two leaders over our community, the Zugot, which is the exact same thing that happened to our Messianic community as well. After Yeshua died and was resurrected and rose up into heaven, who was left in charge? Who was the chief disciple? Peter. Peter, the rock. He was the chief disciple. But when it came to making rulings, when they came to Jerusalem, like the Jerusalem council, who else was there with Peter making rulings? James. James, the brother of Messiah. I, I'm, I'm glad you said John because the, the, the three of them were like also the, the, the bait din for our local, for our messianic believers. So the two is a goat for us, for the messianic community, was James, the brother of Messiah. So he was, um, we would suggest that he was the Nasi because he was also from the lineage of David. He was family of Yeshua. And even after James passed away, they replaced him with another person who's also family of Yeshua. Uh, what was the guy's name? Simon Clopas. Yeah, Simon Clopas. So Simon Clopas replaced him. He was, uh, I think, Yeshua's uncle. And after Simon Clopas, we had another one of Yeshua's family replacing Simon Clopas. So the Nasi line, uh, at least for our Messianic community, was always kept by the family of Yeshua as the Nasi. And the Avbeit then, the first one was Peter. And that's why the Catholics say Peter was the first Pope. Technically, they're right. Peter was the first Avbeit then. He was the first Pope. So they're onto something there. Okay, don't tell them I said that. <laughs> Alright, so that's how that works Okay, let's have a look at what these guys say uh, Yosef ben Yozer of Tereda and Yosef ben Yochanan of Jerusalem Received the tradition from them From Shimon HaTzadik and Antigonus of Soko Yosef ben Yozer of Tereda used to say Let your house be a meeting place for sages Let your house be a meeting place for sages When last did you invite a sage into your house? There's no sage, <laughs> yeah, they don't sell sage at the local Woolies, eh? <laughs> the spice is usually sold out. So, we don't have sages. Um, the, the reason why they, they said this, that your house be a meeting place for sages, is because blessing followed the sages and the men of God, if I can call it that. You sound very uh, modern. Uh, men of God has now entered the building. Um, so, the blessing followed them. So, when they come into your house, a blessing would rest upon your house. In fact, today in Judaism, I remember there was a, a friends of ours um, here in South Africa. Uh, one day, they, they actually converted to Judaism. Um, one day, a famous rabbi from Israel came to South Africa. And the rabbi was telling them about this new couple that's converting to Judaism. He says, he's never met people with such fire for the word of Hashem. And I said, it's because they're Christians. Uh, <laughs> it's because they learned about that <laughs> here in Messianic Judaism first before they converted. Um, anyway, so the rabbi said, I must come to their house and give them a blessing. So after that shul service, he went into the house. And they said, Rabbi, how, do you, how are you going to bless us? He said, because haven't, we haven't finished our conversion yet. We're not Jewish yet. So how are you going to bless us? He said, don't worry. There's a banana on the table. Give me that banana. And he took the banana, and he said the bracha over the banana, and took a bite of the banana, and he said, may this be a blessing from me. My, um, what's the word? I'm sorry, my, yuchus, my, uh, um, my aura, basically. Be a blessing upon your house as well. 
So that's the concept here, that when you invite a sage into your house, blessing comes with them and it fills your house. For example, in the Bible, when Isaac went to Gerar, Gerar was blessed. When Jacob went into the house of Laban, Laban was blessed. How many different sheep and goats did he get just because Jacob was in his house? When Joseph went to Egypt, Egypt was blessed. They would have had seven years of famine and collapsed, but because Joseph was there, they were blessed. So we can't do that today. Like you said, the sages are in short supply today. So one way that we do this, our rabbis suggest, is to fill your house with the words of the sages. Buy yourself commentaries, sidurim. In fact, this is why they say, if you own an entire set of the Talmud, you've got all the words of the sages in your house. There's a special blessing in your house if you have the entire Talmud in your house. So you can have the words of it in your house. In fact, they find a hint at this in the Hebrew. Those of you that can read Hebrew, look at the Hebrew there. Um, so it starts off with Yosef ben Yozer. Go down one, two, three. Oh, it's not going to be the same in my shadow. Let me check you on 640. Um, what page are you guys on? 642. Okay, let me see if I can find it for you guys here. All right. Yosef uh, ben There we go. Number four. You see the Dalit there? Um, okay, so right in the middle, the, the, the middle verse, there's three verses there. The middle one, right in the middle of it. You've got three words and then there's a comma. So there's base, va'ad, lachachamim, and then there's a comma. The first letter of those three words is bait. The next word, ve, uh, vav. The last word, lamed. What does that spell? Bavel. What is bavel? It's Babylon. And they say, it's the Babylonian Talmud. So have the Babylonian Talmud in your house and you will have a blessing in your house. All right, don't read too much into that. That's just a little interesting yeah. thing. By the way, Bavel is probably with the bait instead of a vav anyway, yeah. but uh, don't worry about that. But, uh, yeah, I'll just show it to you guys. Okay, so let your house be a meeting place for sages. Sit in the dust at their feet. Never mind taking out the nice china or the nice couches and saying, sit comfortably. You must sit in the dust at their feet, teaching us humility. Don't ever think you are greater than a teacher of Torah who's taught you something. You might have learned some other teachings and think that you know everything under the sun. Where's the humility in that? No one has ever learned everything. We always have to sit in the dust at the feet of our sages. For example, listen to how Paul refers to his studies. Acts uh, 22 verse 3. Uh, All right, Acts 22 verse 3. Uh, Paul says, I am a Jew born in Tarsus of Cilicia, but brought up in this city and trained at the feet of Gamliel in every detail of the Torah of our forefathers. Even Paul is using the same language when referring to his education. I was trained at the feet of Gamliel. He sat in the dust at the feet. Remember when Yeshua sent the disciples two by two and he said to them, if they don't welcome you, then just shake their dust off of your feet and move on to the next house. Don't give them your blessing. Yeshua says, when you approach them, you shall say, Shalom Alechem, which is placing a blessing upon them. Remember the Shalom Alechem? We sing it every Friday night. And the tradition behind the Shalom Alechem is that there are two angels on your shoulders here, ne? like the cartoons. There are two angels that follow you home after Friday night prayers at the synagogue. And if you get home and the house is ready for Shabbat, the one angel has to bless you by saying, may it be the same next week. But if they get home when your house is not ready for Shabbat, it's chaos, the kids are hanging from the ceiling, the clothes aren't on, you know, the dog hasn't been fed, all that stuff. Yeah. Then the other angel is forced to say, may it be this way next week. <laughs> Alright, so that's the Shalom Alechem song, that's why we sing Shalom Alechem. We're saying welcome to the angels, and the last verse we say, Tetzachem the Shalom. Go in peace angels, saying goodbye to the angels. So when Yeshua said to his disciples, go two by two and greet them saying Shalom Alechem, he was pulling upon the tradition probably, um, he was saying... Either you give them a blessing or not. If they don't accept the blessing uh, or your words of repentance, shake their dust from your feet. They are not humble enough to learn from you or to learn from me, to sit at my feet. Okay. All right. So, uh, sit at the dust of their feet and with thirst, drink in their words. The Torah is always referred to as water. So, with thirst, you shall drink in the words of the sages. Um, Yeshua, of course, went to Jerusalem on uh, Sukkot. And he shouted out to everyone, all who are thirsty, come and drink. Okay, so he offered it to us as well. Mission number five. So the second guy, Yosef and Yochanan of Jerusalem, used to say, let your house be open wide. Clearly didn't live in South Africa. Okay. Let the poor join the members of your household. On Pesach we did this, right? We invited everyone who's poor, come and eat, come and join us. 
Don't let your house only be for your friends and people that you think are high and mighty. Open your house even to the poor. Don't be stingy. We learned about that recently when we studied the, the laws of Tzara'at, right? There are seven deadly sins that cause Tzara'at. The seventh one was stinginess in your house. And what happens is when you're stingy, then you get Tzara'at on your walls. And then the priest has to come inspect your house. And what happens? You have to unpack your entire house before the priest gets there. So that the neighbor that asked you if they can borrow a, a pinch of salt yesterday can see how much salt you actually have in the kitchen when you said, sorry, I don't have any. Yeah. <laughs> your stinginess caused you to be embarrassed in front of everyone. Tzara'at. By the way, there's a story in the book of Acts of um, two disciples, uh, Hananiah and Sapphira, what's her name? Sapphira, Sapphira, where um, they, had, they said, we donated all our property towards the Messianic community, and they lied. And what happened to them? They got burnt up, they spontaneously combusted right in front of everyone. Hananiah and Sapphira. So they were just as stingy. That's what happened with the stinginess, eh? Right, and they all going to say, and do not gossip inordinately with women. Hey, yeah. where's the gender equality here? <laughs> so, don't talk excessively with women is actually what it is. That's the actual translation. Um, the word there in the Hebrew is uh, the word sicha. It's not, it's not um, lashon hara here. It's sicha. It's normal small talk. Do not chatter away inordinately with women because that will eventually lead to gossip and gossip will lead to tzara'at. Okay. Uh, let me just check if I want to read this. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 16. It says, But keep away from godless babbling. It's the same thing here, Sicha. Godless babbling. Um, Skinner. For those who engage in it will only become more ungodly, and their teaching will eat away at people like gangrene. You're eventually going to lose a limb from it. Or get burnt up in fire. Okay. Uh, this was said about one's own wife. Ladies, this is why we never hear what you're saying. The sage just said, we mustn't talk with you too much. <laughs> this is why we don't communicate. <laughs> we don't communicate. <laughs> All the more so does it apply to another man's wife. You should never be chit-chatting with another man's wife. Just don't do it. Simple as that. Don't do it. In Orthodox Judaism, they, they, they separate between the sexes completely. You never chat with another lady alone. You never enter a room with, some, uh, with another woman who's not your wife, if it's only the two of you in the room. You stay out. You don't even climb in a car if it's just going to be you and that Uber driver who's a female. So this is why the Orthodox, they've got an issue when they climb on an airplane and they have to fly somewhere and they're sitting next to a woman as well because they're worried about this thing. Okay, hence the sages say, a man who talks too much with a woman brings trouble on himself, neglects the study of Torah, and in the end will inherit Gehenna. Right, that speaks for itself. So let me not go any more into that because otherwise you guys are going to go home and never say anything to your spouse ever again. Silence is golden. <laughs> no, with your wife you have to communicate, but you don't chit-chat. So there's a difference between talking and chit-chatting about idle chatter. Speaking about nonsense. Because that eventually steals from time you could have been talking about Torah. If you want to talk, make it meaningful. Sorry, but as, from a woman's perspective now, I mean, this is valid for me as well. Yeah. In the sense of chit-chatting just for the sake of filling the air with nonsense. Mm. You know, if, 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 I, if I speak or visit with somebody or even... Yeah, at, at Shul. You know, we try to fill our speech with Torah related or Shabbat related. Mm. So that's fine. Yeah. But yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, hundred percent. Just the context for, for, for Yes, yes, yes. So um, there's a wonderful book you can study. Uh, I was planning on studying it since we started studying the Tzara'at stuff recently from the Chofetz Chaim. You guys have heard of the Chofetz Chaim? Mm -hmm. So the Chofetz Chaim, he was known for how important it was to him to watch your speech, to make sure that you've got pure speech and don't do evil speech. So he put together a book called the Chofetz Chaim, and um, they put it into a nice daily, day-by-day -day book where every day you can learn something about speech. And they encourage you to actually study it every day after one of your meals, just so you learn about how to control your speech. So um, I, I bought the book a few weeks back, and then someone said, oh, I want this book. And I said, okay, have mine. So I'm getting a new one, God willing, next week. Um, and then sometime we'll do it here after the meals. You know when we usually do that little reading? I'll do that one as well, sometime as well. But you can get it for yourself as well, start off so long. Because it's a thick book like this, and there's a daily study, a page for every day for you to study about how to purify your speech. So this was written to, you know, like the disciples of the Savior. So mm. who spent a good portion of the day studying Torah. Mm. And so on. So it's not uh, the common person. Yeah. Mm. So I suppose the common person is speaking to the Torah. I guess so. <laughs> Thank you, John. Now I have to talk to my wife. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, for example, someone who might ask this question is, what if you and your wife run a company together? 
you're in each other's company the whole day long. You know, it's going to happen, yeah. So context does help a lot here. That he's, he's specifically saying it to his disciples. When you get home, don't chit-chat with your wife too much. Rather teach her what you learned today. Yeah. Compliment her. <laughs> Except, yeah, have a cup of tea. <laughs> and then go back to studying. <laughs> okay, mission number six. Yosha ben Parachia and Nittai the Arbalite received the tradition from them. Okay, so who is Yahushua ben Parachia? So this guy, he actually fled from the Hasmonean persecution at that time. This was the time when the Hasmoneans were actually fighting against Jews, from guys like John Hyrcanus, you might remember him, or Alexander Yenai. And this guy fled from Israel, and he went down to Alexandria in Egypt. So this guy was down in Egypt, so too was Nittai the Arbalite. And um, there's an interesting tradition that Judaism created about this guy. Um... In this late second century, because he went down to Egypt, they think he must have met that Jesus guy there, because Jesus also apparently went down to Egypt when he was born, remember? So they made up a story that this guy was actually the rabbi of Jesus. This is not the anti missionaries that make up the story. That this guy was the rabbi who taught Jesus, this Yahushua ben Parachia. And that, <laughs> and listen to this, um, they say that he actually excommunicated Jesus. So don't come with your nonsense here. Stop asking these stupid questions. You're no longer my rabbi. And every day this Jesus would come back and beg him to be a rabbi again and be part of his students and would chase him away every day. This is the story they made up. A clearly fabricated story um, that was made up at a later time in the Talmud. Now, that story actually appears in the Talmud, in the non-redacted versions of the Talmud. They have this idea of that idea. But they're missing it by about um, two generations here. This is before Yeshua was born. But anyway... So just so you guys know, there is that story about him. Anyway, so Yosha ben Barachia used to say, get yourself a teacher. Now look at the Hebrew there. The Hebrew says, asay lecha rav. The word asay is the word for creating stuff. It means make for yourself, lecha, for yourself, make for yourself a rabbi, rav. Not just find yourself a teacher, make yourself a rabbi. If you realize you're not learning properly in this element of your life, Go and find yourself a rabbi who's an expert in that thing so you can become better. Make for yourself a teacher. Don't say, oh, this teacher, you know, I'm going to be as good as he teaches me. No, your job is to make for yourself a rabbi. Find the rabbi that you need that teaches you certain things that you need to learn about. Right? So many of us, we've got many different rabbis we learn from. We come here on Shabbos, we learn together. Mm -hmm. But in the week, we're watching different rabbis on YouTube or listening to this rabbi in the car, etc., etc. Find a rabbi that does something for you that helps you become a better person. Make for yourself a rabbi, he says. Or a pedagogue. He says, acquire a companion. Okay, John's got a question? Yeah, uh, you should say that call no man on earth. We'll get there in a minute. Sorry, you shall call no one rabbi. Oh. We'll get there in a minute. Okay, we'll get there when we get to Rabban Gamliel. Then we'll discuss that topic. All right, so first get yourself a teacher. Acquire a companion. This is the word in Hebrew there, chaver. Chaver is friend, right? So you shall acquire for yourself a friend. Why do we need friends? Because we don't want to be lonely. He's talking about study partners. Someone to study the Torah with. That's why in Judaism you always study. If you go to yeshiva and learn to become a rabbi there in the orthodoxies, you sit opposite. There's always two guys at a table, opposite a table, arguing the Talmud. When you read the Talmud, the Talmud is written in a way that two guys can read it as opposing opinions. So you sit opposite the guy, you say, okay, you take that rabbi's opinion, I'll take this rabbi's opinion, let's argue. And you have to defend even the opinion which is wrong. That you know the conclusion, but you still have to defend it so you can see that guy's point of view when it comes to understanding and his argument of things. It's the same with the Sadducees and the Pharisees. We have to first look at their ways and then argue from their ways why it isn't right. So make for yourself a companion, a study partner, because iron sharpens iron. And give everyone the benefit of the doubt. It's another one of those judging laws. You shall judge favorably. Give everyone their benefit of the doubt. There's a ruling, in fact, that in the Sanhedrin with the 71 judges, if all 71 of those judges found a guy guilty, he was set free. How is it possible that not one of those 71 judges could see the good in that person? There has to be at least one person defending his point of view. Yes, he murdered someone, but how do you not know that they kidnapped his family and forced him to murder the guy? You're just looking at the thing before at the fact, and you're not looking at the context. So we always have to give someone the benefit of the doubt before we go and do that. You have to force yourself to give people the benefit of that doubt. I know, you watch the news and you think to yourself, oh, they're doing it again. Give them the benefit of the doubt when they get caught, then we'll say, yeah, fatswa. <laughs> All right, Mishnah number seven. Uh, he's told me, Nittai the Arbalite. So some versions call him Matai. So there, it seems like there was like a scribal error on what his name is. It's either Nittai or Matai. Matthew, which is a very 
popular name of the time, by the way. Uh, the Arbalite. Uh, Arbal is a place in um, Galilee. Right? So he comes from Galilee. He used to say, uh, by the way, let me tell you, do I know a little bit about this guy? Yeah, so this guy, Nita the Arbalite, he suffered under John Hyrcanus as well. Um, because John Hyrcanus, Jin Hyrcanus, I don't know if you've heard about him, he was actually part of the Pharisees, and then he abandoned the Pharisees to join the Sadducees, and ended up becoming a leader, and he persecuted all the Pharisees, putting them to death. He killed all of his old friends that he grew up with, John Hyrcanus. So this Nittai the Arbalite and his buddy over here, Yahushua ben Parachia, they had to flee from this guy, and that's why they went down to um, Egypt. Now, listen to what he says. He says, keep far from a bad neighbor. In Hebrew, the word bad is ra, evil. Do not associate with a bad person, a la rasha. Okay, you guys have got Russian friends? So rasha is the Hebrew word for someone who's evil. Okay, um, or in the four sons that we have on Pesach Seder, the wicked son is called the rasha as well, the rasha. So do not associate with a bad person. Remember I told you about this chummy of his John Hyrcanos that used to be his buddy but then became a Sadducee and then put all his friends to death? Maybe he's referring specifically to that guy. And do not despair of divine retribution. Don't worry. The wheel dry, they say in Afrikaans, right? The, the wheel turns. One, die, one day that guy will get his comeuppance. Justice and revenge, vengeance is the Lord's. One day what goes around comes around and the guy will get what he deserves. Do not despair. Divine retribution will come. So it seems as if this saying has to do with this John Hyrcanus who did this. He used to be his buddy, and now ended up killing all of his friends and forced him to go into hiding. Mm. All right, number eight. Uh, by the way, it's a lesson for all of us as well. Keep far from a bad neighbor. Do not associate with a bad person. And do not despair when they don't get what they deserve. Elections are coming up. Don't get angry. All right, number eight. Yehuda ben Tabai and Shimon ben Shetach received the tradition from them. Let me read to you guys a little bit about this Yehuda ben Tabai guy. The Talmud reports that Yehuda ben Tabai once sentenced a false witness to death for having testified that a certain defendant was guilty of murder. That witness, though, was actually proven not to have been at the scene of the crime and hence was unable to give a true testimony. After the witness was executed for his false testimony, Yehuda ben Tabai related this to his colleague Shimon ben Shetach. And Shimon reproved Yehuda for having rendered an incorrect ruling. He had the guy put to death by accident. He made a bad ruling. So our sages are not immune. This guy made the mistake and he felt horrible about it. And Shimon ben Shetach reproved him. So who was it that asked earlier, did these two, I think John asked earlier, do these uh, zugot ever argue with each other? They do. They have to. Iron sharpens iron, right? According to al the false witness should not have been executed. Only when two witnesses testify falsely to warrant a death sentence for the defendant. And only if the defendant had not actually been executed, where the two false witnesses were the two false witnesses to be executed. Yehuda took it upon himself to never again pass judgment in a case without first checking with his colleague Shimon ben Shetach. For the rest of his life, Yehuda visited the grave of that slain witness and cried loudly for the mistaken judgment that he had rendered, leading to this man's execution. With this horrific incident in mind, it is not surprising that Yehuda ben Tabai stresses the importance of a clear and honest judgment. There's another story of him that later after this happened, after he had the guilt of putting this guy to death by accident, that, once, uh, that he was walking one day, uh, I don't know where, uh, but he found a guy in the street standing with a knife covered in blood, with a corpse lying in front of him on the floor. And the guy looked at him and realized this is one of our uh, sages, one of our judges. And he said, you are very fortunate for I cannot make a judgment upon you because I do not have two witnesses. I know you're caught red-handed, but I can't make a judgment on you because there aren't two witnesses. And as soon as he said that, a poisonous snake came out of the bushes, bit the guy, and he died there. The guy with a knife in his hand. So Hashem sent the justice when he saw that this rabbi followed the right way on doing things. Okay. So he also fled to Alexandria, uh, to Egypt. And um, very interesting, you guys have heard about the Karaites. The Karaites, you spoke about them last week. It's like a modern version of the Sadducees. Um, the Karaites claim that this guy is the founder of Karaite Judaism. Which makes no sense because historically it doesn't make sense at all. But anyway, just so you guys know that um, they claim this guy, but which is, makes no sense because he is one of our sages we quote in the Oral Torah. And we've got his oral teaching here mm-hmm. that we keep. So he's one of our most rabbinic Oral Torah, pro-Oral Torah guys. You can't claim that if you're enter Torah and you're only um, Sola Scriptura. All right, so Yehuda ben Tabai used to say, when sitting as a judge, do not act as an advocate. Someone else gets paid for that job. You're the judge. When the parties to a lawsuit appear before you, regard them both as guilty. 
Yeah, what happened to uh, innocence until proven guilty? He says the opposite. He says, consider them both guilty because you know that both of them are going to lie through their teeth to try and get you your judgment in their favor. So they're already guilty by trying to defend themselves. You treat them that way. Don't treat them as innocent. But when they leave you, having accepted the verdict, then regard them both as innocent. Even the guy that was found guilty. Because he's admitted to his crime and he's accepted it and he's going to be punished. Clear him of his guilt. Punishment has been handed out. Okay, number nine. Shimon ben Shetach used to say, examine the witness thoroughly. Okay, let me read to you a little bit about Shimon ben Shetach. Shimon was involved in the major religious and political events of his time in the first century BC. He had a very famous sister, Alexandra Salome. Salome was the wife of the ruler of Judea, Alexander Yenai, that horrible guy that um, we just spoke about, that everyone was trying to escape. So this rabbi's sister was the wife of the guy that hated the Pharisees now, that switched from the Pharisees. So when they got married, everything was fine and dandy, and then he became a Sadducee. And she actually told her brother Shimon Meshetach, go and hide, because he's planning to kill you. And she always pleaded with her husband, please stop hating the Pharisees so much. So this is a bit of the background behind the Sadducees and the Pharisees during that time. Okay, so um, uh, his sister Alexandra Salome was the wife of Alexander Yanai, a bitter foe of the rabbis and the Pharisaic community. During Alexander's reign, the Sadducees had control of the temple and the Sanhedrin, while the Pharisee rabbis were persecuted and exiled. When Alexander, when Alexander Salome assumed power after the death of Alexander Yanai, Shimon ben Shetach's influence at the court grew once again. He was able to bring the Pharisees back into power and into the majority of the Sanhedrin. So this guy was a very important guy for Pharisaic Judaism, for us, for our faith as well, to understand that finally we were able to wrestle back the Sanhedrin from the Sadducees. Yes, they still had control of the priesthood because they were still, you know, bribing the Romans. But at least the Sanhedrin, we got back to Pharisaic rule once again because of this guy. So his uh, sister was playing the long game. <laughs> Eventually, I don't know, maybe she fed Alexander and I some dodgy mushrooms and uh, the Pharisees got back in power. It makes me think of all the stories. Um, uh, what's the story of that Yaal that put the, the nail through the guy's head, to, what, to Barak's head, and the story of Judith. Is, uh, is it a Shavuot story? That's why we eat Shavuot. That's uh, why we eat cheese in Shavuot. She also snuck her way into the bad king's uh, inner courtyard with, with a basket of cheese and wine. And once he was drunk, she chopped off his head. It's a Hanukkah story, by the way. It's a Hanukkah story. Chopped off his head and took it back in the basket with her, back to her people in Israel. And then when the war came, she took out his head and said, look, we've killed your leader. Oh. And everyone was like, ah, we lost him. They ran away. And that's the story of Hanukkah. Wow. Huh? Fenster. Yeah, would you like an aircon or the fenster? Fenster. Or a fan? Fenster. Fenster. Can I have your from the fenster from school to mark? As a belief. Thank you. Yes. All right, so. Shimon ben Shetach used to say, examine the witness thoroughly. Oh, wait, I'm still busy reading about him, sorry. Um, so Shimon was a strong leader. In one notorious case, though he overstepped his use of power, he had 80 women of Ashkelon executed for being witches. So if you go to Ashkelon today, you'll find 80 brooms just lying there. Um, in his zeal to root out sorcery, he did not follow due legal procedures in sentencing these women to death. Subsequently, some of these women's relatives plotted revenge against Shimon by having witnesses testify falsely that his son had committed a capital crime. The court convicted his son based on that false testimony. Although it soon became clear that the son had been wrongfully convicted, the law prohibited witnesses from recanting their testimony, and the verdict stuck on his son. This is why he says to us, examine the witnesses thoroughly. Be very, very careful. And be careful in your words, he says to the rabbis who are going to become judges, lest through them they learn how to lie. If you as the judge are sitting in judgment and you use the wrong words, the wrong, um, you're trying to see something from his point of view, you've already given him a bonus he's not supposed to be getting, right? Don't become a tool for injustice. Don't let them use your words against you or for their own benefit. You have to be completely separate from the two parties that are coming before you in judgment. Okay, mission number 10. Shemaya and Aftalon received the tradition from them. Are you guys still awake? I see some of you are struggling. You guys want some coffee? The kettle should still be on. If you need to get coffee, go back, come back. There's not a problem. You're welcome to get up and walk and get, or stretch if you need to walk. All right. Um, I'm going to get my water. Let's take a one second break. Get my water.
I think there are rusks as well. There should be a bin full of rusks as well. There you go. Get there quickly before Nadia takes it off. <laughs> are you guys at home still awake? No, no cameras, come on. You guys are all asleep. Yeah. <laughs> okay, Talana's awake. Hello, Talana. <laughs> and Sam is awake. Hey, how's it, Sam? Oh, how's it, Sam's ceiling? Uh, Stephanie typed, yep, but she did that with uh, hello, 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 Nandi. <laughs> Uh, but I think Stephanie typed that in sleep typing. <laughs> Alright. Good to see you guys. Let's continue studying. Um, actually, let's give one minute. <laughs> There's still a lot of people getting coffee. Oh, okay, we will say goodbye. Right, so we're at Mishnah number 10. Alright, so Shemaya and Avtalion received the tradition from them. Shemaya used to say, Love, work, hate public office, and do not become too intimate with the ruling power. So who is a Shemaya guy? All right, so Shemaya is an interesting guy. He's one of our judges of the Sanhedrin as well. Um, he actually brought Herod the Great before a tribunal. Can you believe that? The powerful Herod the Great, when everyone was too scared. Uh, he brought him to a tribunal for killing Hyrcanus II. Uh, but the problem was he knew how powerful Herod was. So none of the other guys that were sitting as judges wanted to make a ruling against Herod because they know that as soon as you make a ruling against Herod, he's going to chop off your head. Right? We know how Herod was. He was like that, right? Yeah. So what he did at least was he spoke up at this tribunal. And he spoke about this very fact. He said to them, I can't execute judgment on this person on account that Herod would, have, would kill all of us if I do. So we're not going to sentence him. But at least I want to say it out loud. So this guy, you know, at least he stood up for what he thought was right. He used to say, love your work. Hate public office. A public office there in the Hebrew is harabanut. The rabbinate. Hate the rabbinate. That doesn't mean hate the rabbis. Uh, it's just uh, rav means uh, a position of power. So he's saying he must hate the position of power. Not go and throw Molotov cocktails at them. He's saying he must hate being in a position of power. Yes, public office is important. In fact, we can learn about it here that uh, if it wasn't for public office, the world would tear itself apart. But he's saying you should hate the idea of being in a position of power because power corrupts. Like all the Herod over here that we just learned about. And do not become too intimate with the ruling power. Don't let them know you by name. Just let them keep your ID number and your tax number. Okay, so in that day specifically, when there was so much corruption by the Romans and the Herodians, this was a very uh, important saying from him. Okay, Mishnah number 11, Avtalion, who was also down in Egypt. Uh, Avtalion, by the way, is the teacher of Hilal. Hilal studied under Avtalion. Um, so say, uh, Avtalion used to say, Sages, be careful in what you say, lest you incur the penalty of exile. So yes, you're supposed to teach a lot of Torah, but be careful how you teach it and what you say, because people might misunderstand what you say and go and create a whole new sect like the Sadducees. It happened with all the Tzaduk and uh, with the Antigonus of Soka. He said, and find yourselves... Uh, sorry, let me read the sentence fully. Um, be careful in what you say, lest you incur the penalty of exile, and find yourselves banished to a place of evil waters, where your disciples who follow you may drink from them and die. Okay, is he talking about real waters? No, he's speaking metaphorically here, right? To a place of evil waters, where your disciples who follow you may drink of them and die. He was specific. I believe he was specifically speaking about the Sadducees here and Antigonus of Soko. Be careful with the words that you use. Did the Sadducees die? Yes, they died a spiritual death because they don't believe in the afterlife. They literally died for eternity. They don't believe in the resurrection. With the result that the name of heaven will be profaned. Why will the name of heaven be profaned? Because now they're going to make their own ideologies, their own theologies and their own misinterpretations from your words. Even though your words were correct, be careful how you say them. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So does this mean that uh, you know this was written for the time, right? Yes. Does it mean that uh, they're not supposed to be apart from the madness or the equivalent of the same? Um they shouldn't be able to call the government. Uh no, it's not a, it's not a government position, it's more to do with becoming a judge in the Sanhedrin. Hate the idea of being in the position where you get to judge people. Because look at these rabbis. After Yon, for example, gave that wrong ruling. Right? And they ended up with his son ending up in jail. The previous rabbi gave the wrong ruling. 
It ended up with the death of someone innocent. So that's what he's talking about, that ruling. Because in the next line he talks about the, 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 the ruling power, that government. He's saying don't even become, you know, uh, what's it, too intimate with the ruling power. That's, uh, who was in charge at that time? It was the Romans. Hmm. I, uh, I think it applies the same. I think we should be careful of governments. Um, governments don't like religion, eh? Yeah? Unless it's the for them it's the opium of the masses. But um, they governments are just plain corrupt. All of them. All of them. You know, it just corrupts everyone. So, I mean, can you imagine going to our government and becoming intimate with them and trying to live a Torah lifestyle? No. Look what's happening with all the support they're getting for Palestine where Iran's paying them to do these things. It's all political. There's nothing real in politics. So I think the same applies to us as well. Yes, go to all nations and spread the Gospels. If you tell them this is the Gospel and they tell you, okay, well, we'll be in charge until Jesus comes back. Yeah. <laughs> well, what are you going to do about that? Yeah, that's the way. They're not going to care about that. Politics is a world of lies. So, you know, don't even get close to them. The problem is, if you're close to them, you know, you think about the job of like a chaplain, for example. Or someone who represents this religion for the government. I mean, we do this. Whenever the government has like a rally, they have to have someone that represents this religion. They sometimes call a rabbi to come and speak on behalf of the rabbi and do a prayer. And then it happened to you in South Africa, Mos. That um, they'd have um, either the chief rabbi. Usually it was always the chief rabbi that came to do it. And then they didn't like the chief rabbi anymore because he was outspoken words. So they decided to get a rabbi from the reform movement to come do the prayers at the rallies. And then he also had issues with them. Then they decided to get some lady that, we, that some of us here actually know. It came to the shul once or twice. Who claimed to be a, a Jew? <laughs> she came and said blessing. And what did she do? She said the blessing over the washing of hands on a stage in front of thousands of people. So no, it's they don't care about anything. It's all a show. It's all a facade. So yeah, gotta be careful. Even for us, we have to go to the ends of the world to spread the gospel. Other places, it works well. You look at countries where they're actually trying to keep this thing. Argentina. Look at Argentina now with their new president. The guy with the chainsaw. Right? He's so pro-Judaism and the rabbis. And he asks the rabbis for blessings. And he's a Christian. And he loves this idea of studying the Torah. And he says he wants to try and implement all the stuff according to the Bible. Be careful. It's great. It's fantastic. Let's give it four years and see what happens. You can say that with every single one of the prisons around the world. Don't trust anyone. <laughs> All right, uh, Mishnah number 11. Uh, we've done that one, eh? Hey? Yeah, so we're at number 12 now. Hilal and Shammai, the most famous of the Zugot. They received the tradition from them. Uh, Hilal, do you guys know Hilal? So by this time, there was, uh, like I told you, the guys were running away from uh, Alexander Yenai and John Hirkanas. So there was actually a bit of a gap in leadership at this time because of that. So Hilal and Shammai were the first ones to actually bring that leadership back into Jerusalem, into the seat of power there. Once, um, once uh, Shimon ben Shetach took the, the, the Sanhedrin back for the Pharisees, um, there was a little bit of a gap. And these guys, Hilal and Shammai, are the ones that finally came along and started setting things in stone again. They were the ones that uh, started things up again in the land of Israel. Uh, so Hilal, what do we know about Hilal? He was extremely poor. He grew up in poverty. Even by the time he got married, he was living in poverty. He was a woodcutter. Every day, he would get, let's say, he'd get one doll hair for his uh, salary. Half of that doll hair he would give to his family to try and scrape together some food. The other half he would use to pay entrance fee into the study hall of Avtalion that we just learned about. So this Avtalion actually had the entrance fee for his study hall so that there weren't too many people coming there. Um, he had an issue probably with the make disciples of many people. Anyway, so he used to charge. So Hilal used to spend half of his daily income just so that he can go and study the Torah. And the story is told that one day he didn't make enough money. Um, so he couldn't pay the entrance fee. So what did he do? He snuck up onto the roof of the building and listened through a hole in the roof. But it was winter time and it was snowing. And he actually froze on that roof. They had to climb up there. This was on a Friday afternoon. They had to climb up there because they knew that he was missing. They found him and they had to start a fire on the Shabbat. They had to break the Shabbat in order to keep him alive. To defrost him, if I can put it that way, <laughs> for Hilal. So Hilal was extremely poor. So there's a famous saying that if someone ever says, I'm too poor to go to yeshiva. I'm too poor to go to shul to study the Torah. You always ask, are you poorer than Hilal? <laughs> Hilal could afford it. He gave half of everything he owned in order to learn the word of Hashem. Yes. So, from the Zubat to the this is actually given in chronological order. Yeah. So, 
So now that we've come to the level of so we're now talking about the time of ritual, mm. and yeah. uh, even the one that we get on the other would be the time of the hospice. Yeah. So Paul was a disciple of Gamliel, which means Shimon ben Gamliel, the son of Gamliel, would have probably been a contemporary of Paul. They would have studied together. So these are guys that we know. These are important figures for us. So if you want to know what Yeshua learned about Torah, let's look at what Hillel and Shemai taught. This is his generation. All right, so Hillel said, Be among the disciples of Aaron. Uh, just wait a minute. I'm supposed to read something here. Yeah? Yeah, let me read to you about, about Hillel. So Hillel was the most influential of all the sages of the Zagot. Uh, born in Babylonia, he came to the land of Israel where he became a preeminent rabbinic authority and established a family dynasty of rabbinic leadership for the coming generations. His disciples formed what we know as Beis Hillel, the school of Hillel, uh, maintaining his approach to Jewish law and religious worldview. They frequently were at odds with the disciples of Shammai, Beis Shammai. Uh, the Talmud reports that the school of Hillel and the school of Shammai disputed for three long years each claiming that the halakha should follow its rulings. At last, after three years of complaining and fighting with each other, a heavenly voice called out and said, these, are, uh, these and these are the words of the living God, but the halakha follows the school of Hillel. So both the disciples of Hillel and the disciples of Shammai heard this voice coming out of heaven saying, the ruling follows Beis Hillel. Strange thing. Uh, before. Oh, uh, uh, wait, so it's the base Hillel. So that would have been probably afterwards, yeah. So it's his disciples, not Hillel himself. Yeah, so it must have been afterwards. Uh, it's, it's recorded in a Ravine 13b. So I don't know if it's a Mishnah or a Gemara. If, yeah, it's a, probably a Gemara. So it probably happened after the destruction. All right. Um, uh, da, 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 da. The Talmud wonders, if both schools spoke the words of the living God, why was the Halakha determined in favor of base Hillel? It answers... Because the adherents of the school of Hillel were kind and humble people. They studied their viewpoints as well as those of the school of Shammai. Moreover, they showed respect for the opinions of the school of Shammai by, listening, uh, by listing them even before citing their own views in our argument. The Talmud concludes that all who humble themselves are elevated by the Holy One, blessed is He, and all who chase after glory, glory flees from them. This story fits into the general description of Hilal found in the Talmud. He is famous for his patience and his sensitivity to human frailty. He was gracious to those who wanted to convert to Judaism and he taught them, that which is hateful to you, do not do to others. That is the entire Torah on one foot. Everything else is commentary. Go and study. What does that sound like? It sounds like Yeshua. Yeshua would have learned this specifically from Halal. He went it from Allah. Okay, so Allah said, be among the disciples of Aaron. What does that mean? Loving peace and pursuing peace. The Midrash tells us a story about Aaron, that Aaron was always called upon when people were fighting. If Shimon and Reuben were fighting, he would go to Shimon and Aaron would say to him, listen, Reuben's missing you. He feels really bad about what happened. He says he wants to see you again. And then he'd go to Reuben and say, Reuben, listen, Shimon over there, he's really sorry about what he did. He doesn't want to fight anymore. He wants to see you. Meet him at this coffee shop at that time. You guys can, you know, make up. And he would make peace. He would actively pursue peace. He wouldn't just wait and say, ah, one day it'll sort itself out. He would go and pursue peace. Because peace, shalom, is an important thing for us. It's one of the names of Hashem. So loving peace and pursuing peace. Loving people and drawing them close to Torah. Look at the Hebrew word for people here. It says, ohev es habrios. What is a Berea? Berea is a creature. He taught you must love not just someone you consider a person, even someone you consider a creature. A skirmunkle. Love even your enemy. These are the roots from where Yeshua got that from, the teachings from Hillel. And drawing them close to the Torah. What did Yeshua teach us in John 15? If you love me, you will keep my commandments. Love leads you to drawing them close to the Torah. That was one of the messages of Hillel. And that's why it's so prominent in the teachings of our master Yeshua. Okay, number 13. He used to say, a name made great is a name destroyed. So don't seek fame. It's pointless. He who does not increase his knowledge loses it. Okay, I've got a problem with memory loss. So this one hits home. 
Let's, uh, I'm going to read to you what they say here at the bottom. Uh, learning is a lifelong process. If one loses intellectual curiosity, then one sinks into dullness and triteness. <clears throat> if one is not constantly reviewing and replen replenishing his knowledge, one comes to forget what one has already learned. In a hyperbolic statement, Hilal states that one who does not study deserves to die. This might be understood to mean that one becomes spiritually and intellectually dead unless one continues to study. So he goes on to say, he who does not study deserves to die, and he who makes worldly use of the crown of Torah passes away. Wait, let's read that again. He who makes worldly use of the Torah passes away. What is he saying? He's saying the Torah brings death. Have you ever heard that before? Paul says this. And for centuries, people have had issue with Paul because he says this. How can you say the Torah brings death, the law brings death? How dare you say that? Messianics today are throwing Paul out of the Bible because of statements like this from Paul. Well, what happened to Elalia? He said the same thing. If you're using the Torah the wrong way, if you're using the Torah, making worldly use of the crown of the Torah, you will pass away. It's the same thing. You're misusing the Torah and that leads to death. It's not the Torah that brings death, it's your misuse of it. Your legalism is what causes death, is what Paul was teaching, the same as Hillel. He would have learned this from Gamliel, Hillel's grandson. Okay, number 14. He used to say, if I am not for myself, who will be for me? I like this one. This one's like a, uh, almost a philosoph philosophical one. Mm -hmm. If I'm not for myself, who will be for me? So, you know, you've got to stand up for yourself, right? Some, you, someone's got to care about you. <laughs> if I'm only for myself, oh, what am I? What have I become? <laughs> Selfish. And if not now, when? Mm -hmm. Now, that is a lesson for procrastinators. A very personal lesson. I have something I want to share about that, but I'll leave it for later. Okay. <laughs> Let's move to Mishnah number 15. Shammai used to say, make your... So this is now Shammai. He's, uh, I want to say his opponent, but it's also his partner in crime. Shammai used to say... Uh, let's learn about Shammai a bit. Uh, the Talmud contrasts Shammai's personality with Hillel. Uh, Shammai is described as being stern and demanding. He brooked no nonsense and had little patience with those who seek frivolous questions. His followers, the school of Shammai, tended to always make stricter halachic rulings than the school of Hillel. Anytime you see a picture of uh, Shammai drawn, he's always carrying a measuring cubit, a ruler, because he was extremely precise about halacha. Right? There's no gray area. It's black and white. If you're, from, uh, if you're a disciple of Shammai. There's no in-between. There's no uh, mercy because uh, I wasn't feeling okay. No. There's rules. Keep to the rules. Right? And every time he recorded his teachings, his phone would fall over. Okay. So that's Shammai. Uh, so Shammai used to say, make your Torah study a fixed habit. You have to set a time of day. Just like you would pay for a gym membership and make sure you don't miss going to the gym every day. Make sure that every day you set apart time for Torah study. Make it a fixed habit. Habit. It must become a habit. Right? It mustn't be something you do just off, off by hand or by chance. Right? He said, say little and do much. He taught that actions are louder than words. Doing the Torah is more important than just studying it and talking about it. He says, doing it, this is his opinion, doing it is more important. Uh, and greet everyone cheerfully. Hello. Sorry, Shammai says this. Greet everyone cheerfully. Even though he was a strict, no-nonsense guy, he would always show you his teeth first. Mm. Okay. So, Mishnah number 16. Rabban Gamliel. He is a famous one who is mentioned in the New Testament. This is Paul's teacher. Rabban Gamliel, uh, let's talk about him for a moment. First of all, you'll notice he's the first one out of the order of these guys to be called Rabbi. Rabban. So, his generation was the first time the teachers started taking titles, like rabbi. This is what John asked about earlier. So, on that point, let me just get to this first. Um, so he was the first one to have the title, and this was a rabban. Uh, and maybe this is what Yeshua was speaking about in opposition to the idea that started at that stage of people trying, the trend of people trying to give themselves titles about this rabbi and that rabbi. And that's why Yeshua said, don't let anyone call them, be, have themselves called rabbi, because you have one rabbi, and that is our father in heaven. Technically, Yeshua is our rabbi. So, Rabban was the first one. And then after Rabban, you get um, a, rebbe, a rebbe, my reb, or my rav. Uh, and, then, yeah, and then you get rav after that. So, there's like different qualifications about how you call a rabbi. From a rabbi, from Rabban, to my rebbe, to my rav. So, it's like different levels of how qualified they are as well. So, it's like your PhDs and your stuff like that as well. So, yeah. Do you want to add something, John? Yeah, isn't uh, Yeshua the first 
person that is recorded in history as being called Rama? Possibly, yeah. Because the Gospel was written before the Mishnah was written down. And uh, so it refers from the story, I mean, maybe it wasn't a official title. But even before uh, Gavin Biel, you know, um, there must have been people called Rabbi, for Jesus to say. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It must have been like a train starting up at that stage. So before Rabban Gamiel. Well, Rabban Gamiel is the first one that we have officially has done it. But every Tom, Dick, and Harry wanted to be called Rabbi back then. So nothing's changed. All right. <laughs> okay, so Gamliel. Uh, Gamliel, of course, was the grandson of Hillel. So he was still of, of that same lineage. By the way, Hillel was from the tribe of David, hey? So we know that Hillel was a, a, from the Davidic line, and so was uh, old Gamliel, his grandson as well. Um, and Gamliel was really interesting. Being Paul's teacher, I think it's important for us to understand a little bit about him. Gamliel was also extremely friendly to the Gentiles. He had a servant, a Gentile servant. His name is all over the Talmud. His name was Tubby. He would always ask Tubby his opinion of this Gemara or whatever, of this uh, stuff. And he would send Tubby to make his food and stuff and run kosher errands on him. And Tubby was like this amazing servant that he had that never lied to him. And when he would send Tubby to go and find him food for Shabbat. And Tabi would buy a beautiful piece of meat and bring it back. And then he would take that meat and go back because he found another piece that's even better. And said, no, Rabbi, this one's better for you for Shabbat. It's an even bigger piece of meat. So this Tabi was an amazing servant, a gentle servant of his. And when Tabi eventually died, Rabban Gamliel said the mourner's Kaddish for his Gentile servant, Tabi. It's recorded in the Talmud. That he said, that, you know, usually Allah will tell you, Orthodox Allah will tell you, you don't even have to say uh, Kaddish for Gentiles. Mm. He didn't because he studied a lot more about the Gentiles. And that's why um, Rabbi Gamliel was the first rabbi to let his disciples actually go and learn Greek culture. All the other rabbis forbid it. Rabbi Gamliel was the first one to say, all right, you guys are allowed to go and study so that you will be able to argue and defend yourselves when they come with their Greek culture to come and do the stuff to you. And this is why Paul was so... Such an expert in Greek and Greek culture as well. This was why Paul was divinely ordained to be the apostle to the Gentiles. Because he was raised as a disciple. He sat at the feet of Gamaliel, which already prepared him for all these things. So God was at work with the way that he um, made Yeshua come in the generation of Hillel to learn about the loving kindness idea of it. And for Paul to be a student of Gamaliel to learn about how to deal with the Greeks and the Gentiles. And write in Greek. This is why we got so many letters of Paul. Because he learned Greek because Gamaliel allowed him to. Otherwise, we'd be having Aramaic New Testament texts. All right, so Rabban Gamliel used to say, uh, get yourself a teacher. The same thing as the previous one. Make for yourself a teacher. It also says the essay. So you make for yourself a teacher. Avoid doubt and do not make a habit of giving tithes by guessing. He says, when you work out your tithe, don't estimate because estimates cause mistakes. Be precise. I learned this from my grandfather, Shammai. You must measure it to the T. Make sure that when you're offering your offering to God that it is not short. Uh, this, by the way, is very interesting because Paul, what did Paul do in all his journeys through Asia Minor? He collected funds for the Jerusalem community. <laughs> Paul went there and if they ever needed an accountant to work out how much their tithe is, he would tell them, yeah, let me, let me do your books for you. I learned from Shimon ben Gamliel how to be exactly precise in your tithing. Very interesting. What's going to do? Listen to this one. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Mishnah number 17, second last one. Uh, Shimon, his son, Shimon ben Gamliel. Uh, this, of course, would have been then a contemporary of Paul. Paul would have studied with him. Uh, this guy is mentioned in Yom Kippur in the prayers where we have the ten martyrs that get killed. This is one of them, Shimon ben Gamliel. Um, uh, this guy is a famous guy because of his, far, uh, his party tricks. On Sukkot, remember Sukkot is supposed to be the most joyous time of the year. It's the season of our joy. So on, uh, I think it was on the eighth day of Sukkot, they would have this massive party in the temple on Sukkot. And all the rabbis would come and do some tricks to, you know, entertain all the people in Jerusalem. This rabbi was known for juggling eight fire torches at the same time. <laughs> eight! And at no point did he have more than one in his hand. <laughs> Not only that, he would also do something. You guys know planking, eh? When you plank. When you stand straight like this and yeah. you burn and you, the fires of Gehenna are burning your back. He would plank with his thumbs on the floor and his toes on the floor. Straight body. He would plank like this longer than anyone else could. And when he was done planking and showing them and they were applauding him for saying how amazing this is, he would stand up straight from that position without even bending his knees. He'd push himself with his thumbs. Straight up and stand again. Rabbi Shimon ben Gamliel. That's a party trick. 
<laughs> yeah, it's to make people happy. <laughs> Simply to make people happy. So the Torah study. Yeah. He was very stiff necked, so that's why he didn't have to pay. He was a Jew, stiff necked. Stiff necked, yeah. I'm sure he practiced, yeah, 100%. He was in the gym every day after he set time of Torah study. Yeah, he's good at studying. <laughs> All right, number 17. Shimoni's son used to say, All my life I grew up among the sages. You can imagine if this guy's the son of Gamliel, all his life he grew up among the sages. And what would he learn from that? Let's see what we can learn. I found that nothing is better for a person than silence. <laughs> if you spend your whole life among the wisest men in the world, you'll learn to just shut your mouth. Yeah. <laughs> what a lesson. I learned silence. Knowing your place is one of the most important things ever. Not learning, but doing is the main thing. He followed in his uh, grandfather's, uh, sorry, his father's footsteps as well. Um, that's more important. Um, doing is more important than learning. That's what matters. Some other rabbis disagree with him. We'll get to them later on in the Perkei uh, One who talks too much causes sin. So this guy must have been a very quiet guy. All right, number 18. Rabbi Shimon ben Gamliel used to say, on three things does the world stand. On truth, justice, and peace. Truth, justice, and peace. Um, as it is said, and minister truth and the judgment of peace in, Zech uh, in your gates, Zechariah chapter 8. Uh, interesting to note, many of these rabbis have their own version of the three most important things in this world. This seems to be like a running joke with the rabbis. You each, you have to have your own version of what are the three most important things. When it came to Yeshua, with the story we told about the tithing, said, don't worry about the mindil and cumin, the things that matter, the way they matter to the Lord. According to Yeshua's three legs that the world stands upon, justice, mercy, and faith. Hey? Those are the three that Yeshua taught us about. Justice, mercy, and faith. This was his three, Rabbi Shimon ben Gamliel. All right, and every chapter of the Perkei Avot ends off with this quote. Uh, Rabbi Hanania ben Akasya said, The Holy One, blessed is he, wanted to confer merit on Israel. That is why he gave them a copious Torah and many commandments. As it says, it pleased the Lord for the sake of Israel's righteousness to make the Torah great and glorious. That was chapter 1.